if you if we say that the patterns of behavior that the individual learns in coping with the environment then we can infer from that then that the kind of environment the individual inhabits will influence the kind and patterns of behavior he will uh, evidence as a person. An individual then who is seeking for power, who then wants to create people so that they would have a definite relationship to him, will say then that the first thing I must control is what? The environment. I must create an environment because the individual, if he's to survive in that environment, must learn to cope with it. And if it's a tough environment, he must learn to be tough if he's going to make it. If it's an environment that requires him to hustle, then he's got to learn how to hustle. And he's got to learn how to... And yet, after he learns all of these things, they're going to become a part of his personality. And in ways they're going to help him, and in ways they're going to stand against him. And therefore, if I create the environment, I can, to a good extent, create the individual. And therefore, the people in power will read the statement and they will go back to their planning boards and say, how can I create the environment such that black people will be dumb? They will be ignorant. They will hate themselves. They will lack disunity in their relationships one with the other. They will see me as the final validator of truth. They will see my acceptance as the ultimate acceptance. How can I create in them that mentality? And you will see them then creating the appropriate environment. The invasion of this community by Asians and other ethnic groups is a part of the creation of the mentality and personality of black people. It's going to create your children out here. As they walk down these blocks, their personality is being formed as they learn to so-called cope and deal with this situation out here. And to the extent that we sit back and let it happen, to that extent, we're participating also in their creation. It goes on to say, for social learning theorists, behavior is the result of a continuous interaction between personal and environmental variables. Environmental conditions shape behavior through learning. A person's behavior, in turn, shapes the environment. There's a reciprocal relationship. We create the environment and we create a behavior orientation. And then the, the person with the behavioral orientation, what? Recreates his environment. You put him in a slum and then he develops slummy behavior. And then once he develops slummy behavior, he will make slums wherever he goes. And then we will say that he's a slummy person by nature. You know, that's the game. Create create that environment so it's a creative personality and you see it's a slick game and often you see as people we are not aware of the first creation how was the first creation brought about the only thing we often see as a result of the creation and we see ourselves behaving in a certain sort of way and the other group then says you behave that way because you're black you behave that way because you're African <laughs> you see and when you fail then to see how the situation was created then one begins to condemn himself in terms just of himself. And this is why knowledge of how the, how the situation was created is very, very important. This is why ultimately when one gets to know himself, he gets to know other people. You cannot know yourself well and not know other people and ultimately know the universe. The route to getting to know the universe and to getting to know what is going on in the world is through the self, ladies and gentlemen. Because, as I stated before, the self is the result of the universe we live in. And therefore, self-knowledge means getting to know self-creation. And when other people have created the self that one is, then it means getting to know those other people and getting to know how they went about their creation. And that's very important to the recreation of oneself in terms of one's own uh, criteria and one's own values. But unless you get there, and this, you see, is an essential part of African education. The white people don't have to learn this. They don't need to learn this. So therefore, they do not include this knowledge into their curriculum. They do not see it as an important part of education. And a black person then who does not include this as an important part of their education is going to be educated into ignorance and stupidity. And a black person who sees this kind of education as a SOP course as a, uh, what do you call them, elective. Of course, you pick up on the side 
is one that's going to be miseducated. This is the very foundation and basis of any sound education and should occur first not second, not in the third year of college, not in the last year of college, but should occur in the very first semester, should occur really in the very first years of elementary school and work themselves right on up. And so we have it here. The environmental conditions shape behavior through learning. A person's behavior in turn shapes the environment. Persons and situations influence each other reciprocally. To predict behavior, we need to know how the characteristics of the individual interact with the characteristics of the situation. Now, I've often told people the point of psychology, European psychology, is control. You know, a lot of people talk about psychology not being so-called science and not being able to predict behavior the way chemistry and mathematics. That's, that's off the point. That's really not the point of it at all. Because the point of psychology in a Eurocentric sense is not really to describe man as he is but to learn the ways and means of controlling man to the benefit of the European. That's the, the basic point. And when you can con create people, when you can control people, then your problem of prediction is what? It's solved, ladies and gentlemen. It's solved. You see? So when you, re when you remove people's, you remove certain thinking skills from people, when you induce into them certain emotional uh, orientations, when you keep away from them certain intelligence in terms of knowledge, you're creating a personality and you can begin to predict how those people are most likely to behave under certain circumstances. You know what they are, what capable of doing, you see. And therefore, as a Eurocentric psychologist, what you're mainly concerned with is not so much predicting the behavior, but creating the possibilities of some behaviors and the impossibilities of others. And so the main thing you're concerned with is the technique by which this is accomplished, because the prediction part will pretty much take care of itself. And so we have it right here. To predict, we need to know how the characteristics of an individual interact with the characteristics of the situation. You have to interpret this Afrocentrically, you see. Now, many courses will read it and run it through just like that and leave it at that. But see, the white boy, that's all he needs. He doesn't need the other part, the part that I've just talked to you about right now. Because you see, while he's in the college, his dad is another that already manipulated the world. <laughs> you see, and when he gets out, he will enter into that system and learn the real information. But the black one who will learn it as well or better will still be in a position of powerlessness, you see, because often he, he has not read between the lines and often because he's discriminated against, he will not get into the very center of power where he can see the real deal. And so he'll be left with his theoretical propositions and he'll be proud of his unrealistic learning. <laughs> and he will talk about it and, and, and think that his degree, because it is equal to some white man's degree, that it has equal potency, and it does not. It has very little meaning. In fact, that is a part of the deception as well. It goes on to say, reinforcement and social learning. The effect of other people, the rewards and punishments they provide, is an important influence on an individual behavior. Very potent statement there, isn't it? In fact, that is a power statement, isn't it? Yeah, it's a power statement. Infused throughout this whole thing is, how do you gain power and influence over other people? How do you manipulate other people? This is a manual about power. Of course, it's isn't written that way, is it? It's pure, bland, objective, non-racial psychology. Nonsense. There is no course that's non-political. That is the greatest deception run upon by people that courses are non-political. That is the most political statement of all. <laughs> well, this is an objective course. It has nothing to do with race. Then I'm in the wrong course. <laughs> According to social learning theory, individual differences in behavior result in large part from differences in the kinds of experiences encountered, listen, in the course of growing up. Did we hear that? Very powerful statement here. What does it say? 
individual differences, and when I use the word individual, think of group. This is another deception that is run on black people, particularly in psychology. Because often the, the psychology is projected as being about individuals, you see. And often the, the black student then thinks in terms of individuals and consequently is restricted in what he learns. When you're in these courses and they talk about individual, elevate them up to the group level, you see. Because it's to the advantage of the white man, in, in, a, in a sense, while he's educating you at the same time to lower your consciousness to talk about individuals, see? So that you can think that we're just concerned with single entities and not with what? Peoples and the relationships of people one to the other. And if you don't deliberately and consciously say, wait a minute, let me think about this in terms of groups, then you're caught and miseducated right at that point, even though you know the principle well. It says individual differences, but let's, let's, let's substitute the word group. Group differences in behavior result in large part from differences in the kinds of learning experiences encountered in the course of growing up. In other words then, the differences in groups to a good extent is the result of the kind of learning experiences they have encountered. So, if you want to create group differences, what do you create? You create differences in their what? Learning experiences. That is why the European, in order to create the African man, must also restrict the African experience, must restrict the kinds of experiences you have. Because an experience is not just an emotional kind of, of situation, it is a learning situation. An experience becomes often a permanent part of the personality. So you must see experience as learning, okay, not just uh, an emotional uh, a a effect, but as a learning. When you're in a classroom, you are having an experience. We call that experience learning, but nevertheless, it's an experience. Any kind of experience can be a learning situation. So consequently, if, we, if the European is to produce group differences in behavior, he then must have control over the experiences people have, uh, 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 undergo. And therefore, when they experience poor housing, when they experience poor food, non-nutritional food, when they experience poor schooling, when they experience uh, adverse economic circumstances, when they experience the degradation and scandalization of their character, when they experience the kinds of things we talk about here daily in this community, then you're going to get a difference in group behavior. And you will see then that this experience is deliberately designed to create a deliberate personality in black people. Some of you have heard me talk about the rat, and this, this social learning theory is based on what we call rat psychology. And it's very interesting, by the way, why in these psych books you have talk about rats and dogs. Because often the unaware African thinks that that's what the whole deal is about, rats and dogs. Another consciousness controlling tool. And as soon as you mention conditioning, somebody will jump up, oh, the Pavlovian dog. Yeah. You know, they're going to immediately show you how smart they are in terms of the Pavlovian dog. <laughs> you see? <laughs> and how smart they are about the rat and, and you know, the skin of ox. But if you talk them for, to them for a whole night, they never quite get around to how it is that we are the Pavlovian dog. <laughs> and that we are the rat. We never see that part. And yet, look at it, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about the so-called skin of rat, it's a rat taken out of its natural habitat, placed in a box. It is placed in a condition, a new set of conditions, a new environment. It's going to have experiences in that box it has never had before in its life. It must learn to survive in that box and cope with that box. 
It must learn to push that lever in order to eat. It has never had to do that before. <laughs> never. But it's got to learn. It's got to learn that when the yellow light comes on, it can push the lever and get food. But when the green one comes on, no food is coming. It has to learn that it can get food every time it pushes the lever, or to get food every fifth time it pushes the lever, or every fifteenth time it pushes the lever, or to get food every five minutes, and you can just manipulate its behavior around and around and around. Uh, the experimenter says, okay, you're not going to get eat until you hit the bar five times, fifteen times. And sometimes you can see the rat even learns that, you know. Okay. It just doesn't hit the food sometimes steadily. You may hit it fast fifteen times. or the experiment is saying, I'm going to feed you every five minutes regardless of how many times you hit the bar. And that rat will get a sense of time. <laughs> Toward the end of that five minutes, then it'll start hitting the bar. You see? And you can manipulate and change this behavior in terms of how you're going to reward it and how you're going to punish it. It knows something now, and it behaves now in a way that no other rat behaves. <laughs> it has learned something new. Why? Because it has been placed under a set of conditions. It has learned to adjust to those conditions and to cope with those conditions. If it went back to its natural habitat, it would be a strange rat, I'm telling you. And we know sometimes how so-called tamed animals, as a result of their social interaction with human beings, are unable to even survive in their natural environment because of the way they've, they've uh, had to survive in their natural environment. And so what we recognize in the Skinner experiment is this, that the rat not only lives in a condition and in an environment, the environment and the condition does what? Lives in the rat. And the rat is an expression of its environment. As a matter of fact, the environment and conditions speak through the rat and literally uses its body to express itself. This is why often we can hear some people talk the way they dress, the way they walk, and tell where they're from. <laughs> because we not only live in a neighborhood, ladies and gentlemen, the neighborhood does what? It lives in us. It expresses itself through us. We are its vehicle. It comes out through us. So consequently, when another people shape your neighborhood and they shape your schools, and they shape the experiences you will have, they are in the process then of creating us as human beings. We have to recognize that. This is why the black student has to look at the rat not as a rat, but as a prototype of himself. And if he does not see that rat that way, he's been miseducated. I don't care how many A's he makes equal to the white boy, he has been miseducated. And yet the white man has sat right there and told him exactly how he's doing it. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no bones about it. And I often tell my students then, look at this rat and this experimenter, not from the point of the view of the way it's written in the book. So consequently, when another people shape your neighborhood and they shape your schools and they shape the experiences you have, they are in the process then of creating us as human beings. We have to recognize that. This is why the black student has to look at the rat, not as a rat, but as a prototype of himself. And if he does not see that rat that way, he's been miseducated. I don't care how many A's he makes equal to the white boy, he's been miseducated. And yet the white man has sat right there and told him exactly how he's doing it. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no bones about it. And I often tell my students then, look at this rat and this experimenter not from the point of view of the way it's written in the book, but look at it as a power relationship. The experimenter is able to create the behavior in this rat as a result of the power that the experimenter has over it. Because there's a power differential there, isn't it? Yeah, there's a power differential there. Look at it as a political situation where the experimenter has control over when that rat is going to eat, how it's going to eat, what it's going to eat, when it's going to get fed, and all of the other things. And through the manipulation of those things, manipulates the rat's behavior, but ultimately creates its personality. And then I go back and say, let us see then in your own community who controls your water. 
Who controls your food? Who controls your jobs? Who controls your symbols, your status symbols? Who controls the pay? And you will recognize then that through this control and through the power over vital things like food and water and shelter and jobs, we are created as a people. Through the vital ability of this white man as the experimenter to reinforce the kind of behavior he wants to reinforce and to punish the kind of behavior he wants to punish, he creates black people and African people the world over. And it's not black people in America, it's black people in the Caribbean, it's black people in South America, it's black people in Africa and Asia and wherever you find them. When he says, I'm not going to give you this loan this time. <laughs> or, starve your people, but you got to pay Chase Manhattan Bank. Oh, you mean your people are going to rise up in rebellion? Well, we'll send you aid in the form of police weapons so you can shoot them down in the streets as they riot about the price of rice because you got to pay us. And therefore, you become a bill collector for the system itself. And therefore, the monies that you can use to build schools and other things for your children now must be used to feed the fat cats. And therefore, the children are made ignorant and the children are, are made without education and the economy lags and a whole social political system is created that ultimately works itself into the very personality of the people in that system. And those people, to a good degree, then are created. It is only then when we begin to look at these situations from that point of view that these sort of bland lessons you see here have real meaning for us as people. And so what we're saying here then ultimately when we look at the so-called so social learning theory, we're saying then that it is the nature of the social relationships between men, between people, that to a good degree helps to determine the characteristics of us as persons and as groups and, and as people as a whole. That is why we must be concerned about the nature of the social relationships we have with other people. Now then, this is a preface and I, I, uh, to the induction of self-hatred. And we're going to continue it as a uh, short, and I'm going to end short of it. I just want us to understand what we're dealing here. It's not enough to say that uh, the whites induce self-hatred into us. I want us to see how this is achieved through the power and the ability of the white man to manipulate reinforcements. The ability of the white man, an ability that we to a good a degree has uh, let him have unchallenged to, to manipulate reinforcement that is going to make our self-hatred possible. Because we just don't hate ourselves uh, by accident. That hatred is deliberately induced because it serves a political, social, economic purpose. But that self-hatred cannot come about merely in terms of what white folks say about us, the, the white attitudes toward us. It must be related to power. It must be backed up by the ability to punish and the ability to reward. And therefore, what is said, when it is combinated with power, then becomes the vehicle through which self-hatred is induced. I'm going to, in the, in the following lectures then, look at the various means by which self-hatred is deliberately induced in, like, if we're going to talk, uh, I'll, I'll list uh, some of them right quickly to indicate where we're going. And we'll talk a bit about the first one here. The association of innate, personal, group characteristics with negative ass assignations. We're going to talk about, if, you, if that's not enough, that is, if creating self-hatred through just making a person's innate characteristics uh, negative, or be, be perceived as negative, then one creates the characteristics. In other words, you create the characteristics that you hate. And this often happens, of course, in parental relationships and other relationships where, in a sense, you make the person into something. You make them a thief, and then you hate them for being a thief, you see. And to a good extent, what has happened to the, the African personality is he's created 
a character is created so that that character can be hated, so that that character can be used as a justification for exploitation and misuse and abuse. And we want to look then at uh, that method and that technique. Uh, and, and, and this is quite a complicated one, followed up by you, you can by the fact that you can induce self-hatred through what we call making positive, desirable characteristics unattainable, therefore creating an inferiority complex, self-negation uh, through social comparison. E and so forth, white and make it only attainable by whites, then you induce self-hatred by those people who cannot make themselves white. And so often then one of the ways of creating self-hatred in an individual is putting those things that will get him out of that self-hatred out of his reach. And we will see that that is one of the methods. To create a reverse mentality and behavior and to create desires by punishing the right orientation and by rewarding the wrong orientation. In other words, we're going to talk about how the black personality is reversed and turned backwards so that uh, the individual will, will almost, uh, by habit, produce backward behavior. We're going to talk about this producing of backwardness, which produces frequent failures or, uh, goes, or, or success by accident which produces a, a feeling of cursedness. We're going to also then talk about de-individuation as a method of, of creating self-hatred. That is, reducing the individual's concept of, of, of uh, himself as an individual. Also, the creation of maladjustment through a number of techniques. The, uh, in our next section, then, we're going to look at the first segment here, the association of innate ethnic personal characteristics with negative assignations. You will see in the Bible itself that Adam, in this mythological account, is given control over creation by being given the power to name and classify all that is on the earth. In a sense, when God tells Adam that he is, that it is his prerogative to name and classify, he symbolically now is giving him control over the earth. The ability to name and define is a very powerful ability. And one of the major powers that the European has that we have got to take back is the European power of definition, of naming and determining what uh, is real and what is unreal. One of the constants that I talk about, that is, I often try to get across the idea that despite how much things appear to change, they remain the same. And that we as people must not be deceived by superficial change. That often superficial change is deliberately created as a way of maintaining fundamental sameness. You must look at the real power relationship between Europeans and Africans. That is the key. And you must question whether that power relationship has changed at all over the past four or five hundred years. You just cannot look at the idea that you're now, now in slavery and say that means we have advanced in some sort of way. Or that now we have certain job opportunities open to us, educational opportunities that open to us, that now we can eat at the same counter with white folk and all of this kind of stuff as indicative of basic fundamental change. As a matter of fact, to a good extent, these changes have been diversions to keep us from seeing that the very fundamental relationship between blacks and whites has not changed at all. I have often said that you may marvel about how now you can get a degree in computer technology and how this was not available to your forefathers. But remember that your forefathers as slaves also had skills. They just did not chop cotton and work in the households. They were skilled craftsmen as slaves. And in fact, at the end of, 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 of slavery, there were more black craftsmen and skilled craftsmen in some areas than there were whites. But what was the fundamental relationship? The fundamental relationship was, was that these skilled slaves 
worked for the benefit and power of their masters. And that fundamental relationship has not changed one whit to date, ladies and gentlemen. You do computer engineering, but you're going to do it for IBM, and you're going to do it for GE, and you're going to do it for some white man ultimately. It's the same game, ladies and gentlemen. You may hang out in the same office. You may even marry them. You may even sleep with them. You may eat with them. But the fundamental power relationship is what? Still the same. Still the same. It's had some change. And the thing you have to look at then is, are not those superficial changes, but the fundamental relationship. And there are several of them that you will see have existed for the past three, four, five hundred years and that are still pretty much where they are today. And that even integration and even assimilation and even at the eating at the same lunch counter and even the electing of black men to office and black women to office, even the electing of one to the presidency of the United States is going to serve the same function to maintain the ultimate power of the white man over the black man. And therefore you cannot be deceived by those things. And this comes out of this ability of this white man to name and create definition. One of the books I would recommend for the reading list is the book White Over Black by Winthrop Jordan, a very uh, copiously de uh, detailed book, and one I think you should uh, certainly read, and I'll be indicating some others, of course. And this one I'm sure is still around. I don't know whether this one is available in the general market. Yes, and we have some of them here. The Negro's Image in the South by Claude H. Nolan, L-O-L-E-N, The Anatomy of White Supremacy. And of course, the one that I intended to quote, uh, to quote from extensively tonight, Franz Fanon's book, Black Skin, White Mast, which I highly recommend that you read. And of course, while you're reading these now, read some others because they can be a bit depressing, but you, you, you want to you wanna look at them very closely. So, you know, read uh, Diop's African Contributions to Civilization, Pre-Colonial Africa, uh, uh, some uh, introduction to African civilization by um, Jackson. Jackson and some of the others are sort of, uh, you know, waited out a little bit. <laughs>